Hey everybody, welcome to Three Minute Thursday. It's your source of animal rights news and the gossip packed into a short, sweet three minutes on everyone's favorite day. It's a Thursday. Today we're gonna to be talking about the Grand National Horse Race in the United Kingdom. We're gonna be talking about animal rebellion, but of course, the, the protesting against it. And of course now it's Animal Rising is protesting. So we're talking about Grand, the Grand National protested by, by Animal Rising. Welcome to episode 151. It is obviously a Friday. I, I have a little bit of a stuffy nose. I can't shake this thing, so I, I apologize. Um, but I didn't do one yesterday because I was tired and I just thought oh, maybe I should get some rest instead. But here I am, I'm still a little sick and I'm still making a video, except for it's Friday now. The algorithm hates me and you hate me and everything's falling apart. It's fantastic. It is almost to the end of the month again, which means we're gonna be giving away thousands of dollars on the Patreon. If you wanna join for the little as two bucks a month, you get to nominate who that money goes to. We all vote on it. And whoever gets the most votes gets all the money. We send it there as simple as that. I'm going on a world tour. I'm pretty excited. It starts April 29th uh, in uh, Portland, Oregon, and it ends April 30th in Eugene, Oregon, a couple hours south. It's going to be good. April 29th, we're going to do this like intro to animal activism, like lessons learned type of thing. It's called Better Veganism. How I think we can make our activism a little bit better based on lessons learned from my past uh, 20 whatever years it's been of animal activism. If you're interested in checking it out, head over to Facebook or Instagram for the details. On April 30th, I'm going to be in Eugene. We're going to be screening the animal people with civil liberty Liberties Defense Fund. Is it, I don't think that's right. CLDC. Civil Liberties Defense. I don't know. It's the lawyers that do good things for activists. Also, certain days calendar is going to be there. These fine folks who I point out every year, I love the calendars, I love them. They do great work to support political prisoners and also my co-defendant Josh will be there as well. We're gonna be screening this thing, doing questions and answers. And most importantly, it's gonna be a fundraiser for the people that have been arrested in the uh, Cop City protest campaign down in Atlanta, Georgia. All right, let's talk. So if you are vegan, there's no way that you could have missed the story about 18,000 dairy cows that burned alive in an awful fire in Texas. It, it was brutal. It's going around on social media. I'm sure you saw it. It looks like it was maybe faulty wiring or something that created the fire and, and it became a huge story, including videos that showed uh, the barns burning and you were like able to hear the cows inside. And this was something I'm not going to show here. Um, I didn't watch it. I don't want to watch it. And this is my VSA, my vegan service announcement, that you don't have to watch it either. Like, yes, I understand uh, it is a very in-your-face form of outreach for people who aren't vegan. Um, I get that. But as one vegan and animal rights activist to another, you don't have to watch it if you don't want to. It doesn't make you weak or less of a vegan or less of an activist. If you want to watch it, no shame. If you want to use it for your activism, go for it. But don't feel guilted into doing it. I think as animal rights activists and vegans, we spend a lot of time intentionally traumatizing ourselves, um, watching undercover footage, watching documentaries, going to vigils during the transportation of animals into slaughterhouses, uh, going into farms, going into laboratories. All these things have value to them as activists, but we don't all have to do all of that, right? And we don't have to inflict trauma on ourselves because we feel it's required of us to make us better activists. If we can handle it and we think it's strategic, then great. But personally, I think that's a big component of why there is so much burnout in the animal rights movement. A lot of people feel guilted into doing something over and over and over again that just destroys them inside and they burn out. But that's another conversation for another time. All this is to say, take care of yourselves, be good to yourself, and don't ever feel pressured to do or watch something you don't want to. So with that, episode 151, let's highlight a few stories that, that made me smile. So the CAFT campaign, the Coalition to Abolish the Fur Trade, their campaign against Louis Vuitton rages on. I think if you are versed in the idea of pressure campaigns and the understanding that the targets will continually become more challenging, then you knew this fight was gonna take a bit longer um, than some of the previous ones. Um, this is natural, but it doesn't mean headway isn't being made. There's a lot of great things going on even this week, in weeks of actions and protests and phone call-ins, um, lots of groups working on the around the world um, doing a lot of great things. But the little things that I always like seeing though is, is this little piece. Did you catch that little thing? So the idea of combining tactics, tactics that are often taken from different groups and, and, and combined together to engage in a new form of activism. So in this case, right, there, as you can see, folks from Animal Defense League, New York City doing disruptions, but also using those monitors to do outreach at the same time, combining things like vigils and outreach and cubes um, into disruptions and protests and bringing those things together. I'm a big fan of it. I think this is a great example of how that can be done. Also, let me say, I'm just excited to see uh, Animal Defense League, New York City is back. Like they were a force to be reckoned with back in the 90s when taking on the Macy's anti-fur campaign. When I think of like amazing anti-fur activism, I think of like the grassroots stuff that was going on 
in, in cities around the United States, in particular in New York City. Like a lot of the activism that we see today and pressure campaigning in the grassroots is really uh, a lot of that foundation was built on what groups like the Animal Defense League uh, was doing back in the 90s. And so I'm excited not just to see it revitalized, but also coming back with some of the things that worked for them in the past and using them again in the future. And even some of the people from the past, uh, ADL now working um, with the new one. So that's, that's pretty cool. I'm excited to see it. Good on you. I saw an article pop up about vegan extremism, so how could I not take a look at that? The Niagara County Sheriff's Office in New York sent out a notice to farmers to warn them about vegans coming to take animals. I mean, that sounds pretty good to me. One farmer uh, woke up in the early morning to find people snooping around his barns. So to anyone snooping around barns in New York, uh, Paul Strobel, uh, he's looking for you. But honestly, like, be careful, right? Now, now, the authorities assumed it was animal activists or vegan extremists because there was a Right to Rescue Summit the same weekend in the area. I'm not like a big fan of the Right to Rescue campaign. Again, another conversation for another time, but I am a fan of people being safe. Uh, even when taking animals from places of use. So if indeed it was those damned vegan extremists creeping around at night, good on you for taking some risks with your activism, but also please be safe about it. You don't want to run into Paul. Okay, how about this absolutely bizarre story out of New Zealand where the North Canterbury Hunting Competition added a junior category for all the kids that want to go out hunting. And what would these kids under the age of 14 be hunting? feral cats. Yeah, they're going to send kids out to kill feral cats and then penalize them if any of the cats came back microchipped, meaning they would have lost points if they had killed someone's pet. So the silver lining to this is that there was such an uproar and the animal rights group SAFE stepped in and they got it all canceled. So nice job, everyone. And finally, we have to talk about Animal Rebellion who is no longer Animal Rebellion. They have now rebranded as Animal Rising. And personally, I'm into the new look. I'm into the new feel. I like the rollout. I like the new stuff. I'm into it. It was said that they wanted to move away from being the sister organization of Extinction Rebellion and move into something that had more space to be able to focus on animal issues outside of the lens of climate change. Sounds good to me. And they kicked it off by disrupting a famous horse race in the United Kingdom called the Grand National. This is a notorious race that saw one horse die in the first lap and two other horses crushing the legs of a woman watching the race. And this comes on the heels of 50 horses dying in UK horse races in 2023 alone. That's like one horse every other day. So over 100 activists tried to gain access, some using ladders, and ultimately they managed to disrupt the race. And now I'm not a fan of random disruptions, right? Disrupting just to disrupt. But the thing that sets this one apart for me, beyond this being a pointed attack on the horse race, um, it was that it was used to spark a national conversation, not just about horse racing, but about animal agriculture and its destructive path for animals, humans, and the environment. And sure, it's a little bit of a wonky path to go from a horse race into um, the world being destroyed by animal agriculture. But I think one example of this um, working well was animal rising activist Alex Lockwood going on the UK's national news, GB News, a right-leaning network, and having an 11-minute debate where he did, a, I thought, a, a great job of directing and, and pushing the, the conversation to where he wanted it to be. In my opinion, I think this like Tucker Carlson wannabe thought he would make quick work of an animal activist and he ended up being a bit owned. And this is just one example of how a disruption of a horse race was well spun into a national conversation about our food systems. And this is what I think Animal Rebellion, now Animal Rising, has done quite smartly and strategically throughout their short existence. They pick smart targets to disrupt. That in and of itself is a strategic target, like shutting down all the McDonald's supply chain in the UK. I thought that was great. And then using that attention to launch a bigger conversation. And this feels like what is lacking with other organizations that are focused heavily on, on disruptions. Sometimes not thinking two steps ahead. Disrupt whatever we can, regardless of what it is, and then hope enough media comes out of it that allows us to talk about something different or the bigger issue or whatever. We want. And I think if this is the type of activism and strategy you want to engage in, good for you, I'm not opposed to it, but I would look towards Animal Rising as a bit of like a how-to guide. But whatever you decide to do with your activism, education, action, disruption, protest, disobedience, Ideas, design, writing, so forth. So let's keep it smart. Let's keep it strategic. Let's make it successful. And we can do all of that by questioning ourselves, engaging in constructive debate and dialogue. And of course, as always, if we keep fighting. 